This is the Berkshire Hathaway Annual Meeting. 20,000 people come from all over the world to Omaha, Nebraska for a weekend of fun shopping and to see their hero in person. They even get to see a movie about him. It all began with a key strategic alliance. A merger 100 years ago between Microsoft, Walmart, and Starbucks. Micro Walbucks. However, an elite rebel force of investment bankers created me, a biogenic being who can travel back in time and stop the strategic alliance from ever taking place. I am the Warrenator. This is the annual meeting in April 2004, and Warren Buffett is front and center. What do you think they most want to hear this morning? I, well, that's the nice thing about taking unfiltered questions, as you yeah. find out. I mean, you know, the press is naturally on governance issues right, and that sort right. of thing. But in the end, you know, we'll end up talking about what shareholders want to talk about. Yeah. And that's, that's it is a kind of weather vane of, the, yeah, it, of, yeah, of where yeah. they are in terms of you know, what it, their concerns are. And yeah, we'll get 50 or 60 questions by the end of the by 3.30 this afternoon. And yeah. uh, uh, interestingly enough, every question almost comes from somebody outside of Omaha. The Omaha people yeah. don't, they seem to defer to the out of and, and But we'll find out what's on their mind. Near the end of April in 2005, we went inside to see what happens. Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, sit on stage and answer questions for more than four hours. We work together. We really don't have any choice because he can hear and I can see. <laughs> a few years ago, uh, we have a, a dinner at, at Garotts the day after the meeting, and <clears throat> we were in having, the whole family was there having dinner, the place was packed, and it started raining cats and dogs, and a waitress came to me, we were eating, the waitress said, uh, she said, I got to tell you, she said, that it's, it's raining like crazy outside and there's a long line and Michael Eisner is standing out there getting soaked. So I turned to Suze, and, and Michael and Jane are friends of mine, good friends, and I, uh, I said to Suze, uh, why don't you go out there and help them out uh, before they get drenched? And she looked at me and said, I've waited in line at Disneyland. <laughs> My name is Molly Fenner. I'm 11 years old and I'm from Long Island, New York. What is your view on PetroChina? <laughs> if you come up at the break, Charlie and I will have taken all the pieces out of here that we like best. <laughs> and you will, be, you will get the rest. <laughs> Charlie, do you have anything to add to that? She wants to know what you think about PetroChina. We have real owners on our board, and what they make for being board members is really inconsequential, as I get reminded occasionally, uh, com compared to their investment, and they're friends of mine. They're smart. They're very smart. I mean, they are hand-picked in terms of, of business brain power and quality of, 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 of the human being, and uh, I really think that, you know, we have the best board in the country, but the people that want who make their evaluations by checklists, uh, you know, whether either in terms of diversity or in terms of, of supposed independence, although I don't know how anybody that's getting half their income from board memberships can be independent. Uh, you know, we don't, we may, we may not stack up so well, but, but it's, uh, it's the kind of board that I want to have knowing that if I die tonight that Virtually everything I have goes to a foundation. I want to have that foundation have as much money over the years to spend as possible. And there's no group of people I'd rather have in charge of the decisions subsequent to my death than the people that we've got on our board. The correct system is the LAU root system. 
Elihu Root, who had three different cabinet appointments, if I remember right, said no man was fit to hold public office who wasn't perfectly willing to leave it at any time. And if Elihu Root didn't approve of something the government asked him to do, he could always go back and be the most sought after lawyer in the world. He had an identity to go back to and he didn't need the government's salary. And I think that ought to be more the test in corporate directorships. Uh, is a man really fit to make tough calls who isn't perfectly willing to leave the office at any time? My answer is no. Yeah, we have one of our directors who was, who's been removed twice from compensation committees of other corporations because he had the temerity to actually question whether the compensation uh, arrangement being suggested was the appropriate one. I mean, it, uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's being put on the comp committee of American corporations, as I've said, they're not, they're looking for chihuahuas and, 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 and not Great Danes and Dobermans and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I hope I'm not insulting any of my friends that are on comp committees. <laughs> You're insulting the dogs. No. <laughs> The degree to which the administration or uh, other people are worrying about the deficit in Social Security 25 years out when they have a $500 billion deficit excluding the Social Security surplus now, I mean, it just strikes me as nonsense. <laughs> Here we are deploring something that's going to happen in 20 years that's a fraction of what is happening right now while they're cheering, you know, basically. And Charlie, what do you say? Well, that's the uh, view from Berkshire's Democratic chairman. <laughs> And, and the odd part of Berkshire on this issue is that the right-wing Republican who is speaking feels more strongly than Warren that the Republicans are out of their cotton-picking minds to be taking on this issue right now. Remember that the annual meeting of Berkshire, as it has evolved, is without any close precedent in the history of the world. No capitalist enterprise had ever had an annual shareholders meeting, anything like the one we have. We just morphed by accident into this enormous event that everybody loves so. Charlie is the best partner a guy could have. Now Charlie is, is he's in Los Angeles, I'm in Omaha, and Charlie has got multiple other interests, but any time on anything important that I want to have the world's best brain working on, and he can usually get the answer in about 15 seconds, I can pick him up and talk to him about it. He understands everything about me, he understands everything about Berkshire. He doesn't spend all day thinking about it like I do. He's got plenty of other things he does. But when he's needed, he's there and he's right. Berkshire Hathaway is now a $140 billion company. It began when Warren Buffett came back from New York after working with his intellectual mentor, Ben Graham. When you came back from New York, uh, in the 56, I think 56. it was, having studied and worked with Ben Graham. What was the dream? What was the ambition? Well, I, it was kind of disgustingly low. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I had about $150,000 uh, at that time, and I felt, you know, if I earned 10% on it, that'd be $15,000 a year, and, and I could live big <laughs> on that at the time. I was... I was interested in reading and, and taking courses at the university. I took my father-in-law's course in psychology, and, and uh, uh, I thought I might go to law school. I knew there were a whole bunch of subjects I wanted to read about. And then I sort of stumbled into this partnership a few months later because seven members of the family uh, said, we want, to we want you to handle our investments, and I didn't want to do it one at a time or tell them what I was doing. So I put the seven together in a partnership that had $105,100 in it. You can guess who the $100 was. <laughs> <Yes>, I <know. laughs> and, and, and I thought that was it. And a few months later, a fellow named Homer Dodge, who had been a stockholder of Graham Newman, came out, saw me in Omaha, and he said it, Graham Newman was liquidating, and, and he said he'd asked Ben where to put his money, and Ben said maybe Warren would be a good choice. So he joined me for, I think, about $100,000 at the time. And then four months later, some fellow in Omaha that read the legal notice, actually, a friend of mine called me up and said, what are you doing? And I told him, and he did it. So yeah, I just kind of 
stumble because along. Because stumble along, yeah. all of a sudden you have a partnership right. and I you're never, making money. And I couldn't sell Keo now. <laughs> <laughs> but the partnership did well, and part of the partnership was buying what looked like cheap stocks. Berkshire Hathaway looked like a cheap stock. It wasn't a very. It was a terrible business. What was your ambition then? Now you have a vehicle. Yeah. Well, I started out by thinking I was a textile expert, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that, I was disabused of that notion fairly fast. I really did. I, I thought, you know, well, well I'll, you know, <laughs> what, what do these guys know about making textiles? They've only been doing oh, it a few hundred years. I mean, the Egyptians, I think, figured out how to weave. <laughs> so, but I've been in Omaha for a while. That's I right. I, I know, you know a lot about textiles. Just turn me loose at the plant and see what happens. So anyway. Uh, what happened was right at that period the textile business was good for a very short period of time and so I was like a duck floating on a pond when it was raining. I was going up in the world but I, and I thought it was because I was flapping my wings but it, it was that damn rain that was coming down. And, and then when it quit raining, I mean, I found out, what do I know? <laughs> right. And then, then we went into other businesses. Yeah. And what, so all of a sudden, I mean, was it, you went into other businesses, meaning you've, you had some cash flow coming in. We there. had some cash, not, not very much, yeah. but we had some cash around. And when Jack Ringwald decided to sell his insurance companies in early 67, uh, we, we paid 8.7 million, I think, 8.4 million, I guess it was, 8.4 million. And we had, in Berkshire, we had, I don't know, maybe four or five million around, maybe we borrowed a few million. But that's, so that was your first entry into that was the, insurance the, entry, business. the insurance business. Why was the insurance business? Attractive. Well, it, it it does control money, and 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 if you've got somebody that's doing a decent job on the insurance end in underwriting, it gives you money to invest on my end. How much of your revenue comes from the insurance business? Well, uh, a lot comes from insurance, and then we have a lot of money that's generated by insurance. Right. So insurance has propelled our growth. There's no question about that. Because it gave you money to it work. gave us money to both invest in marketable securities and also money to buy businesses outright. And then in 1965, you have a chance to take over, right, Berkshire. What happened? After a while, I realized what a lousy business I was <laughs> in, and we didn't get out of the textile business. But I decided that, that to the extent we could, we'd try to add on other things. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, Charlie, the. Uh, I'd have been better off if I'd done all the subsequent things without putting them in Berkshire originally. I mean, if you just talk financially, uh, Berkshire, the textile business was a drag for 20 years. So if I, instead of buying these things for Berkshire, we just bought them in, in a separate entity, the X. Then you know, why didn't you do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out fine. But I, no, I don't know. But everything worked out. But yeah. I mean, if you look back. Looking back, it was, it was, it was a big, fundamental, wrong decision from a financial standpoint. To get involved in the textile business at all. Yeah. I should have just gotten out of that and gone on and done these other things. But do you themselves. tell me why you didn't? I kind of stick with things. <laughs> <laughs> it's that. Yeah, it's I really do. I mean, here was things. Here was. I, I, it's just my personality, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm driving a car after eight years. I'm living in the same house after forty-seven years. Your net worth about that time was about six or seven million dollars. That probably is about right. Yeah, that's probably about right. Because in 1962, when I formed. When I put all the partnerships together, it was about a million, and when I wound up, it was about 25, and so it probably was. What are you thinking? I mean, I'm just going to continue finding investments that I can make, and well, everything during, will turn during out all right. In the mid-60s, I was running this partnership, so I thought I was going to keep running right. the partnership, but, and then I, I got to where I didn't think I could do that well. And Why so, did you think that? Well, the market in 69. Oh, the stock market. The stock market just went crazy, and, and it was a little like, you know, in 1999 and 2000. I mean, I was left behind. And I didn't want to do things I didn't understand and that didn't make sense to me. But I also didn't like sitting there while everybody else was, you know, running rings around me. And my partners were probably not saying it, but they might think, you know, has this guy lost it? So, so I gave them all the money back. And I gave them the shares at Berkshire and got a lot of them myself as part of that. And then I, I just kind of got more involved in Berkshire. It, you know, it, it became my painting. I was only painting an hour or two a day at the start, and then I started painting like crazy. <laughs> so you had a stake in Berkshire. Right, and I actually bought more, but I just decided I'd put all my money in Berkshire and, and ride with it. And ride with Berkshire as yeah. a vehicle, just as, as a just as Yeah, as a kind of an extension, a corporate extension of me. <laughs> yeah. And are you out of the textile business by then? We got out of it. No, we did not get out of the textile business for 20 years. <laughs> I even bought another textile company. I, I mean, this is, a, I, you know, I've got to confess. I, you know, I, yeah, this, is like, this is like a revival meeting now. I'm, I'm going to just please. go up to you and we need to. forgive me, will you? Because I, I, uh, I bought another textile company. I bought something called Wombeck Mills in Manchester, New Hampshire. <laughs> Why did you do that? Uh, only my psychiatrist knows. <laughs>
<laughs> I, again, I thought I was going to solve something by doing it. I mean, yeah. I, I solve really, something. Well, I mean, I thought that these two put together would do better. Some, <laughs> some crazy thing. I mean, <laughs> I did it myself too. No management consultant told me to do it. So it was it was 19 about 85. I mean, 20 years later, but. Uh, before we got out of the textile business, the guy of the textile business. So I said it's a little bit like watching a parade with all these other textile companies, and you stand up on your tiptoes, and then everybody else stands up on their tiptoes <laughs> to it, and all that you don't see any better, and your legs hurt. <laughs> and that's what happened with textiles. <laughs> In 1973, would maybe your first big, first run at the Washington Post. I, I, you began I bought to buy shares. Yeah. How did you come to the conclusion? I looked at the prospectus in 1971 when Charlie and I first met Katie Ram one time, and they were going public right at the time of the Pentagon Papers. And then in 1973, uh, the stock got very cheap because their television licenses were under challenge by B.B. Rebozo, Nixon's friend, and the, the stock went from, I think, like 38 to 16 or so in a very short period of time. And when it got down to around 20, uh, just in a few blocks, we bought almost 10% of the of, of the company, and that now is about 18% because they've repurchased shares. Okay. When it got to about 20, that meant the whole Washington Post company, it had 4,800,000 shares out. The whole Washington Post company was selling for $100 million. Now, they owned the Washington Post, they owned Newsweek, they owned four big network television stations, including, including CBS Washington and Washington, and, D.C., and, and all of that. Jacksonville, Florida. I mean, everything, and they didn't know any money. And if you had taken those separate parts, you literally could have been out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, at midnight in a rowboat, and you could have sold them for $500 million. People would have been swimming out in shark-infested waters if necessary. And you could have had all of it for $100 million at that for time. For $100 million. I mean, you weren't going to get all of it. because yeah. Here's what I don't understand. How come 95 people didn't see that? It was amazing. We were buying it from big institutional investors, and they were bailing out of it. And if you'd asked any one of them what the pieces were worth, they would have said, something close to what I would say, but they thought the stock was going to go down. So, so what? You know, and the stock did go down. <laughs> In fact, after we bought it, it went down a little more. But so what? Warren Buffett believes that I'm not looking at the price of the stock, I'm looking at the value of the business I'm looking is. at the properties and I'm looking at the Graham family. I mean, that stock we paid about $10 million for is probably worth a billion and a half or more today. Paid and they haven't... They, 10 million and 10 it's million, worth a billion and a billion half. And a half. And they have not struck oil. They have not invented a cure for cancer. You know, they've just taken those properties and kept doing reasonably intelligent things and sometimes very intelligent things with the money generated by it and they've developed the properties they've had and they've been terrific stewards of the money, but there's, there's no miracles involved. Warren bought into the company without my knowing him. That's why I say luck really plays a role in people's lives. It just does. A lot of people said stiff arm him, he's buying too much stock. Um, he means you no good. And my native instinct was, let's take a look. Let's see what he's like. And everything I learned about him was very good. So I asked him to come and take a look at the company in which he just bought these shares. Um, he had to write me a letter when he owned 5% of the company saying, dear Mrs. Graham, I've just bought 5% of your company and I mean you no harm. Uh, and I think it's a great company, and it's, I know it's Graham owned and Graham run, and that's fine with me. And so I got to know him, and I thought, whoa, this guy's really terrific. So after he joined our board, he used to come to board meetings with about 20 annual reports, and he would take me through these annual reports. I mean, it was like going to business school with Warren Buffett. Couldn't have a better teacher. No, it was wonderful. Kay Graham told me that, you, that when she met you, she'd never even understood how to read an annual report, mm -hmm. that that's what you brought to her, some sense of being a, helping her come to grips with the idea of making business decisions. Kay was very, very smart, but she thought, because she, this had been pushed into her by her mother and her husband to some extent in the, in the past, she, she thought only males who had been to business school could run businesses. I mean, she, she had been, she had the intellect, but she didn't have the confidence. And I told her my job was to get her away from looking into that funhouse mirror that she was looking into about herself and distorting it, and looking into a real mirror. And when she looked in a real mirror, she'd see a person that was perfectly capable of running the Washington Post or any other company. How long did it take her to learn that? Well, it was, you know, fits and starts over time. But, yeah. but she, I, I had the right raw material. I mean, yes, she was she good. She was good. And, and she would had beaten into her a, over such a long period of time uh, 
that that wasn't what she could do in life, that it, it, took, it took some convincing. To, and she had to see evidence of success and all that sort of thing. I said, Mrs. Graham, I said, you know, you control this company lock, stock, and barrel, but you're still worried about me. So I said, what you're doing is you're looking at me and you're seeing fangs, and I'm telling you these are baby teeth. <laughs> and I, I said, they really are baby teeth, but they always look like fangs to you, and there's nothing I can do except, even, except take them out. I said, even though they're baby teeth, I'm going to just take them all out. So I'm perfectly willing. You call George Gillespie up here, your lawyer, and I said, I'll sign an agreement that I'll never buy another share of stock of Washington Post unless you give me the okay. And I said, I'm fine. Uh, you know, I want you happy with me. <laughs> I want you nervous about me. And so George came up, and I took out the baby teeth, and she saw fangs falling to the floor, and we got along great ever. ever okay, after. but then, but you already had. We had, we had ten million point, invested, had, or not? Yeah, we had ten million invested. We had nine, nine, we had nine percent, nine and a fraction percent of the stock. I told her the smart thing is to repurchase your shares. I mean, it, and and the shares I would otherwise buy, you should buy for the company, and and we'll all get richer if if you do that. And and she had a lot of other people advising her otherwise. But she finally, she decided to do it, and that's the reason we now own almost 18 percent, I believe, of the company instead of nine and a fraction percent. The Buffalo Evening News was bought in 1977, 77, right. and I gave Kay first shot at that. You did what? I gave Kay first shot at that. You said, I, I'm, if, you, if you don't want to buy it, if I you don't want to, Yeah, I'm going to buy it. Why would you do that? I just felt that, you know, she'd been good to me, and, and we were a big holder, and they were in the newspaper business, and, and she wanted to buy things. Uh, so I just said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to not gonna find that I went up to see Vince Mano on a Sunday and bought this thing away from you, so that you otherwise would have bought. So I, I gave her a shot at it. In 1983, you purchased Nebraska Furniture Mart That's right. for $60 million. <laughs> Mrs. B. Tell me about her. Well, she, this is a woman that walked out of Russia, got on a peanut boat, landed in Seattle with a tag around her neck, couldn't speak a word of English, and the Red Cross got her out to Fort Dodge, Iowa, which is what the tag said. She couldn't learn the language. She moved to Omaha because there were more Russian Jews here that she could talk with. Her oldest daughter started school, came home and taught her the words that she learned. She took 16 years to save $500 so she could start this company, and she's selling used clothing, bringing her siblings and her mother and father over her 50 bucks at a crack. And in 1937, took $500 and went into business and competed against all these people who had all kinds of advantages over her in every way, and she killed them. And she, she killed, killed them? Yeah. And and how was she able to kill them? She cared about it. She was smart. She knew the limitations of her knowledge, and she, and she was confident within her circle of confidence, competence. She didn't get outside of it. And she took care of her customer. She sold sheep. And it took her a long time, but she built the largest home furnishing store in, in the country in a town like Omaha with 700,000 people. So how did you come to buy it? Well, I was in love with this operation. I mean, <laughs> that's my kind of woman. I, mean, <laughs> I bought it when she was 89. She worked till 103. There was a period there where she left for a couple of years. If you went over to Mrs. B's house, as I did, and you very nice house, and you go in and on her sofa, her lamps, her bed, there'd be little green tags hanging down because it made her feel like she was at the store. I mean, this is, this is a remarkable, remarkable woman. And the punchline, Charlie, is she couldn't read or write. You know, and, and I think every business school in the United States ought to study her. I mean... What would they learn? They would learn the essence of business. They would learn that taking care of your customer is what it's all about, taking care of... And, and by that, I mean giving them good deals, you know, which nobody would touch, and she... Uh, and working, working like crazy. I mean, she was there day after day after day, and, and she, she, she had a passion for it. And the truth is, if you, if, if you took the Fortune 500 CEOs, and I gave you first draft pick on 10 of them, and I'd put them in competition with Mrs. B, she'd, she'd win. <laughs> no she, doubt. She'd win. Yeah. Michael Eisner was here, and I told him the story. He loved it. And uh, <laughs> Michael wanted to, to get the movie rights, and uh, Michael could be very persuasive, but, but uh, I saw him stand there with Mrs. B's daughter, the same daughter I referred to earlier, you know, who's now, who at that time was probably close to 80 or so, and, 
and uh, Francis is this tall and Michael's that tall, and, <laughs> and Francis is uh, saying, my mother wants a piece of everything. <laughs> when you hear an 80-year-old say that her mother wants a piece of everything. I mean, <laughs> That's great. So Mrs. B, <laughs> Mrs. B wanted them, whatever they were going to do, whatever she wanted right, a piece of the I action mean, herself. Yeah. If they were going to make Mrs. B doll, she wanted <laughs> all a piece of it. And they didn't teach that in any business school to her. She <laughs> no, picked that up that's from, right. that's exactly from understanding right. that's value. Right. Ownership was everything. She understood business. <laughs> And she when, understood people awfully well, too. In 1988, you started buying Coca-Cola. How come? I, I don't remember exactly. I probably read their annual report. Uh, I probably read the 1987 annual report, and I've been, I've watched it some, but there just comes a point, there's a tipping point, you know, in terms of knowledge you've accumulated over a period of time, price changes in the stock, which had gone down some. They were heavy repurchases of their own stock. Roberto and Don were doing a terrific job. Nothing bad was going to happen to Coca-Cola, so I started buying. Most of it in that period from the middle of 88 to early 89, but then about a little further on. But we put overall about a billion dollars into it, and it's probably worth about eight billion now. And you have no intent to sell? No. You have said, though, that in, during the bubble... It got overpriced. There were some Very things that you might have sold sure. and would have been wise to have sold them at that time. If I was running the partnership like I did back in the 60s, I definitely should have sold those stocks. I mean, they, the, it, stocks went crazy. And but you do not today look back and say, I should have sold Coca-Cola when the bubble was there because... It, it just, I, it wasn't me. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I... I, I I knew it was selling at a very fancy price and I even wrote about it in the same way with Gillette. But, but you know, I, I don't do that very often. I'm not saying I wouldn't ever do it. I mean, if we went into the wildest speculative sure. orgy in history, orgy in history, and some of these things went crazy, maybe I would sell some. But I, it's not my. It it goes against the grain. For one thing, bu wonderful businesses are not that common. And if you get a big position in a wonderful business, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> what is the single best investment on a large scale that you have made? Geico twice in my life. Uh, three times in my life has been a good investment. I mean, it was a good investment when I was, when I was uh, really 20 years of age, and when I, when I bought, I put three quarters of my net worth in, in Geico when my net worth was like $10,000, and, and, and that caused my net worth probably to double or something like that, and that was, that was great at the time. In 1976, the company got in trouble, and what we bought what turned out to be half of the company for like $40 million, and then in 1995 or so, we bought the other half for $2 billion. <laughs> and that was a good deal. <laughs> so it's, it's been a triple play. Help me understand this. You, you're sitting with more than $40 billion, essentially, in cash. Right. You could buy some big businesses, I would assume, for $40 billion. Right. But you don't see any at a price that you want to own. That's right. And, and when I look at the deals that have been made in the last year, there's not one I'm envious of. So, I mean, it isn't like we missed them. Uh, I mean, they, all, you know, it may turn out that, that I should have bought one of them, but I mean, there's none that I feel, gee, I wish I'd bought that last year. But I hope I buy one tomorrow. <laughs> I know, but I mean, there's nothing. I mean, you know, you don't look at General Motors and say... I look at General Motors. <laughs> General Motors is selling for about $15 billion now. There's 500 million shares, 28 or 29, something like that. You know, and the whole General Motors company, $15 billion. And of course, that was the most powerful company in the world, you know, back when I was a kid. So I mean, <laughs> it's, and you could... You could have it in a second. Well, I don't know about that, but I but well, I no, certainly well, can buy. I can, I can buy know, plenty what, of. What don't you know about that? I don't well, know I mean, I, I mean, 15, buying the whole if, company if, is a different story. How much but, is the whole company? Uh, the whole company would cost fifteen billion. That's about one hundred percent of the stock. Yeah. So why couldn't you get pay fifteen billion dollars and get general? Well, Motors? they might. They might. <laughs> not like me doing it. And some other things. Oh, but, oh sure, sure. But, I understand. But that. nevertheless, I could buy a lot of stock uh, at a valuation of fifteen billion. And you think it's a good buy today? I think it's too tough to figure. Too tough to figure. Yeah. You know, it is a company that sells 25% of all the vehicles in the United States and, and, and one-seventh of all the vehicles in the world, you know, and employs hundreds of thousands of people, but it's got some terrible obligations outside, uh, outstanding. Mean, like Fiat or that's what they well, took Fiat, care of? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the, well, the Fiat deal, they, they solved for $2 right. billion, right. but still $2 billion Things out like the door. That, yeah. But they, no, the, the big problem was that they really entered into contracts with the UAW and that were based on their, the economics of market dominance, and they don't have market dominance anymore, but they still got the contracts. <laughs> uh, 
And I don't blame the UAW. I mean, you know, they, they, it was a free will negotiation. But, but they, they signed up. I think they're paying like two and a half people that don't work for every, people, uh, for every person that works or something like that, you know, in terms of uh, retirement and health care. And, and that gets to be crushing if you're competing with people that don't have the same obligations. You've looked at this closely. Oh, I look at all the things. <laughs> <laughs> when you read eight hours a day, yeah, right. you have a chance to yeah. cover a lot of... Yeah. A lot of... But General Motors, and listen, I, I, I think they're doing a great job considering the hand they're dealt, but, but General Motors is a huge annuity and health insurance company with a major auto company attached. And unfortunately, the huge annuity and health company has got a terrible bunch of contracts out. I mean, it is worth some big minus number. And the question is, is whether the auto company is worth a big enough plus number to offset that big n minus number, but you can't separate the two. And you can't figure it out? Well, I can, I can figure it out. I no, can. no, but, but, but you can't what? <laughs> well, I, in the end, I can't come to a conclusion that, oh. that, 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 that it's obvious that Well, the, that's what I mean. You yeah. can't, make, you can't no, no. come to a conclusion. Right. Because you don't have all the facts? Or no, because, I got the facts. What well, don't the, you know? I Why can't you reach a conclusion? I, I don't know whether you can exist with the kind of obligations they've got and 25% of the market and very tough people like Toyota and all kinds of people coming at them who, who don't have those costs. They call them legacy costs. Here is the dilemma. You got $40 million in cash. $40 billion. $40 billion, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's, there's a difference. There's a difference, yeah. <laughs> And you've gotten so big that you've got to make a big play. Right. That's your problem. That's my problem. And I thought it was a problem when we were a lot smaller, and it was, and, but it's a bigger problem now. So what happened? And if I'm lucky, it'll be an even bigger problem five years from now. <laughs> and, 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 and you... So what, tell me how the dilemma plays itself out for you. The odds are good, Charlie, that one way or another we will find reasonably intelligent things to do with most of the money, but they won't be as intelligent as the things that we could find 30 or 40 years ago with much smaller amounts of money. Nowhere close. Because there are few there. They're, they're right. It just can't. It won't happen. What's the test? What test does it have to meet? It has to be a business, I understand. It has to be a company that I think has some kind of enduring competitive advantage. It has to be a management that I like and trust. And it has to be at a reasonably attractive price. Price is the least important, but it's still important. And you'd like to own all of it? I'd like to own but all of it. But not necessarily. But not necessarily. It's a very small, it's a small field to... It's a small field when you get to have as much money as we have. It was a big field 30 or 40 years ago. When I bought the Washington Post stock in 1973 and 74, there were hundreds of companies that met my test. It was just a question of, you know, Choosing deciding, the best. deciding okay. absolutely. And the one you like the most. Yeah. The combination. Mm -hmm. You don't have any single candidate right now. That's true. That's why you see these tears in my eyes. <laughs> it is. I mean, tell me the emotional feeling. I mean, you. No, no, no. I, you know, I, I, not only tears, but there is a certain sense of. It's, I mean, happened, you're, you're, it's happened before. I mean, I closed up my partnership in '69 because I didn't feel there were any opportunities then in what I was doing, managing money. And there weren't. I mean, as a, at least for me. And, I, you know, in the year. In, in, in 1999 and 2000, in the, in the general stock market, there was certainly nothing attractive. And we found some businesses then. But. It, it happens from time to time. I mean, I am not in a business where you can do something smart every day. I'm not even in a business where you can do something smart every year, but I may be in a business where you can do something smart every three or four years. Yeah, but I mean, I read every day about one more big deal by, by a group of private equity guys in the paper today. Right. And they're, and they're using other people's money, and they get an override, and, and, and their calculus is not the same as my calculus. And right now, that enables them to pay way more. Tell me how their calculus is different. Well, they, they just, it's, it's money they get from somebody else that they get paid quite a bit of money on if they don't do anything, and then they get a percentage of the upside, and they don't take the downside. I mean, that is, that is a different calculus than Berkshire's. Yeah, you, you have the upside and the downside. Uh, upside and the downside, and I'm going to keep them forever, and I'm not going to dress up the accounting or rearrange things a little and resell it to They're the public. You're not going to take a big fee for doing it. No, so I don't have an exit strategy, and I'm not getting paid just to sit with a whole bunch of other people's money. You know, it's my money. <laughs> we sat down again with Warren on June 29th, 2006, after he had made some acquisitions since we last spoke with him.
Let me talk about the future of Berkshire Hathaway. Right. The last time we talked about the rise of Berkshire Hathaway, you were sitting on, give or take a billion dollars, about $44 billion. Mm -hmm. You didn't find anything that you were very interested in making an investment. Since then, you've made some investments. Yeah, we've spent over $10 billion this year. And, uh, one was Iscar. One was Iscar, which was $4 billion, 80% we bought yeah. of a $5 billion business. Pacific Corp was five and a fraction billion. And yeah, we, we're, we're finding a few things. The important thing is to find big things. Okay, for you, you have a yeah. unique size I'm, scale I'm, problem. I'm looking for elephants. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, did anything change between say 2004 and 2006? I mean, because you don't look at the economy as much as you look at the business. I only look at the business. Yeah. I mean, there's never been a business that I passed up that I liked because I had some view on the economy that maybe it'd be better next year. Yeah. There's never been one I bought because I thought the economy was going to do particularly well this yeah. year. You know, I, I, I look at, I look at a business. We're going to hold it forever. If if I hold, let's say I live 20 years, that's pretty optimistic. But let's just <laughs> say I do. You know, in those 20 years, there can be a lot of good years. There can be a few bad years. You know, uh, in the economy. But what difference does it make? I mean, it's like playing 18 holes of golf. There's some par threes and par fives. And, you know, by the, the only way to get to the clubhouse is to play them all. You know? And if you like golf, you play them all. I like business. And, yeah. and so we're, we're going to play the tough years. We're going to play the, the, the easy years. And if we got the right businesses and the right managers, it's going to work. I mean, why couldn't you have seen Iskar in 2004? Because it was just that company. Nothing happened to them or huh? nothing happened to you to make the investment in 2006 rather than 2004, except... The CEO wrote you an email. That's right. I never heard of the company in 2004. That's the reason. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, very hard to do it if you haven't heard of the company. And I never heard of I, I, I never heard of Aton Wertheimer. But he yeah. wrote me a letter yeah. in October. This is the guy who's the CEO. He's the CEO and the owner and his family. And he wrote me in October of 2005. And he said, he told me a page and a fraction of, about the company. And he said, Berkshire is a logical home for us. And he said, I'd like to talk to you. So he came over from Israel and we talked. But if he'd written me in 2004, we would have made the deal. It, you it would, would have, have been cheaper, too. Yeah, I right. wish he had written me in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is understanding why you didn't see companies was nothing having to do with the economy, no. nothing having to do with anything other than you just simply hadn't seen one. Yeah, yeah. It, it, or, or, it's availability. It's availability. availability. Yeah, and, they, and, they, sometimes it's something that happens in a family you know, the, 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 there may be more people or they may owe taxes or who knows what. I mean, we buy when they're ready to buy. It's ready to sell. And I don't go out prospecting. I, I let my interests be known. But I get a lot of people say, well, why don't you call on this person? Why don't you call on that one yeah. and, you know, soften them up? Or, sure. you know, and yeah. and the, I don't do it because it, 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 my batting average would be terrible. It, it just... Uh, you've got to wait till they're ready to do something. And that's when we hear about companies. So they come to you when they, they're ready? When they're ready. My phone rings. At this stage in your experience, you know pretty quickly if it's right. Yeah, but like about two minutes. You know? <laughs> I mean, I read the letter from Kathy. I knew it was right. I mean, you, you know. Knew. Uh, 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 you can tell you can, Have you, you ever can met girls, Charlie, that you knew it was right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want to get personal, but, <laughs> but there's some, you know. You know, just, you know and, not, and you know that other people would like them, sure. but it's just not for They're you. They're just not for you. Yeah, I They're know. just not exactly. for you. Exactly. Uh, but, but that has to do with, I mean, you, you, you can see the numbers immediately. You've got to make an evaluation of the management. How can you yeah. do that so quick? You just have, at this time in your life, it's, an instinctive no knowledge. Yeah, it's not going to always be right, but it's usually going to be right. One more time for the criteria. It is in terms of an earnings that... We're looking for 75 million pre-tax Plus 75, 75 million. You're looking at management. You're looking at... A, a simple business, one I can understand, which really means simple. <laughs> and, and we're looking for management in place. And we're looking for a seller that knows the price he wants for his business. The seller must know yeah. the price. Is it a hard negotiation or is it pretty quick? I mean, you, they know what. You're... Very quick because they know that. I mean, if if I like the price and if I if I if it meets the test, I can say yes very fast. I mean, I, it it doesn't take any time really, Charlie. Now, I, there's others. If I spent two years on them, I wouldn't know the answer at the end of two years. But I do know the difference between the ones that take two years <laughs> and the ones that take two minutes. And you like the ones that take two minutes. Yeah. And you don't go to some investment bank to do the due diligence. No. No. If I, if I need them. You know, I need a doctor maybe to tell me about my health, but if I need them to tell me about a business, you know, they ought to be running Berkshire. Uh, I did not. I did not take money from four hundred thousand people 
to essentially start farming it out and ha and say, well, I lost your money, but this guy, I thought he was good. <laughs> it just happened he was wrong. <laughs> it's my job to know what I'm doing. And if I don't know what I'm doing, I don't do it. Well, we've established that you know what you're doing. <laughs> no, no, not always. <laughs> Coca-Cola is one example. Uh, your value, the value of your holdings going down by about $8 billion, haven't they? That's... <laughs> you hit it right on the button. <laughs> Let's keep this quiet. <laughs> I mean, does it ever, do you ever say, man, what am I doing here? My, my commitment to the end is... No, I, no I, 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 looking back, I made a mistake by not selling you gold. You could have gold. sold it at a time, years ago, right? Something. Yeah, but, but no, I don't, I, don't look, I, I don't look back on things. You know, I, okay, I, but let me just stay with that yeah, idea. Yeah. So you look back and you say, when it was $80 a share, I should have sold it, because mm -hmm. that was at its... Top, say, or close to its top, and fifty plus times yeah, earnings. Right. Yeah, fifty times times <laughs> earnings. Um, but but it's not in your blood to want to sell. No, but I I do sell marketable security sometimes. Okay, I don't sell is, businesses. Right. But I I do sell. Okay, marketable sure. And this security. is a marketable security. That was a marketable security. As is American Express. Yeah. As is. Yeah. But I don't sell C's Candy or the Buffalo News. Oh or, sure. Yeah, I don't sell businesses. So um, for, for we're in, you're in married to them for better or worse. Yeah, I've got one section in the annual report and I put it in every year, that if a business like that promises to lose money indefinitely or if they have major labor problems or something, but just because, I, just because I don't think it's going to do very well or I could use the money better elsewhere or because I get offered a crazy high price for something, I don't sell them. I got offered a crazy high price for something here recently that we own. And I told the fellow that called me, I said, I don't do it. You can look in the back of the annual report and you'll see I don't do it. He said, well, I read it, but I didn't believe it. <laughs> he said, I, I believe it now. <laughs> he thought he could buy it. And he, he thought found he could buy it. He, he, he named a number to me. That he, and it was a good number. It was a good number. If, if I was trustee of a children's home and that was the only asset of the children's home and it was my responsibility simply to do, get the best economic result for the children's home, I would have had to sell it to him. Exactly. Since I last talked to you, you have, with the consent, with the, in concert with other members of the board, have chosen the successor? Well... What we have, Charlie, is we have three that could do it. And every meeting of the board, we don't have very many meetings, but <laughs> every meeting of the board, that's the subject. And the question is, if something happens to me that night, who do they put in charge? So they always go away knowing what they would do the next day. Now, there's, there's, there may be a, a pool of three, but we have settled on one at, at any time. And, mm -hmm. and so if something happened to me tonight, tomorrow morning, the board of directors of Berkshire... Uh, would convene and they they would know exactly who they were going to to uh, put in charge. You will run Berkshire as long as? As long as I keep my marbles. And you have somebody that'll come to tell you that you don't have them if necessary. Well, I, 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 uh, yes, I, I've assigned that job to my children. I, I tell them, I tell them, they better all three come in together because if just one comes, I'm cutting them out of the will. <laughs> you have said that you want to keep if you could find $30 billion in acquisitions, you're prepared to do that. Yeah, and you well, want to just keep in reserve $10 billion. About $10 billion, yeah. Now, why that breakup? Why that Well, I think, I think that a company that writes the catastrophe insurance and all of that sort of thing that we do should have plenty of liquidity. I mean, I want, I want Berkshire always to be the rocket Gibraltar. I mean, we, we've got 400,000 shareholders. We've got people who have workers' compensation claims against us that are quadriplegics or that are going to be getting a check from us 60 years from now. I've got no business fooling around with anything mm -hmm. close to the, to the solvency of, of Berkshire. So I, uh, I, uh, I will keep it way, way over on the, uh, on the safe side in every respect. And having a lot of money around, you know, when you're in the insurance business like we are, I don't want to depend on letters of credit from banks or anything right, of the right, sort. Right. You know, I don't want to, no too big to fail doctrine to bail us out. I really want us and to be... And $10 billion is the right number. We're, well, no, who knows about, what the right number is? I understand. Is, yeah. but, bear about. Is the insurance business still as attractive to you today as it was from the beginning? It's always been a, a, a business that sort of fits me. I mean, it, it, it gives you the money first. So it, 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 the, the investment element is important. It also is a business that where, you know, you're, you're calculating odds on things and... That's what you I want. guess I, I, I was probably destined to be a bookmaker, but I, my dad wouldn't let me. <laughs> you can calculate off. But, I mean, in the insurance business, is, is the increasing number of hurricanes, yeah. the increasing number of, of the terrorism is a fact of life today. I think so. No, no matter how you can write a policy against all those things, I mean, does it make it any less? Is it well, you have to get the right, you have to, you have calculate. to calculate the odds right. You've got to get the right premium. And 
you never know whether you've gotten the right premium. I mean, and, uh, you know over a lifetime whether overall you've gotten the right premiums for things, but you lose on some policies and, and, and on other policies nothing happens. And so you don't know in any given day or week or month whether you're doing the right thing. But over, over time, you'll see whether your judgment has generally been right. And, and it, it's an interesting game. Has this scandal affected it all? No, I wouldn't say so. The, uh, all of the controversy about AGI and AIG. No, I mean. we're doing, you know, we do a lot of business. I mean, we've got a lot of different irons in the fire in the insurance business. I mean, we've got Geico, the right. auto insurance. So we've got a lot of different insurance businesses. And, and uh, no, it'll be, it'll, it'll be the most important business at Berkshire throughout my lifetime and probably a long time thereafter. One thing you're doing is looking out to international companies. Is it for the first time? No, I've always been interested, but we, we haven't been on the radar screen very much for entire businesses abroad. People did not think of us in Germany or the UK or, you know, up till now, Israel. Yeah. They had a business to sell. Now, I've always looked at international stocks, and we've always owned some international stocks. Tell me how you see the economy today. Well, the economy still is pretty good as we sit and talk today. At, uh, you know, people... They've taken lots of equity out of their, uh, or they've taken, they've extracted the equity that's appreciated in their houses uh, big time in the last few years and all of that. But if you looked at the economy right today, you'd have to say it's pretty good. Now, it, we've got plenty of problems, but they are not manifesting themselves in business today. Do you worry about inflation? I worry some about inflation, sure. Sure, inflation Inflation is never gone. It's always in remission. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's very easy. Never to dead. It's never dead. Yeah. Uh, but, but it, uh, and it's something that is man-made and governments can create. And, and it oftentimes seems preferable to some alternative that's in the here and now. So you have to worry about, anytime you have governments, you have to worry about inflation. And what about oil prices? Well, I'm, I'm no good on oil prices. I mean, you know, we're using 84 million barrels a day or so in the world of oil. And if something disrupts three or four million barrels a day of supply, like something happening in Iran, perhaps, uh, yeah. you know, it, the, the marginal barrel will go, will go crazy. We're on the edge. Yeah, yeah. We've got less reserve capacity by far than, than we had 15 or 20 years ago. When you uh, think about the dollar? I think the dollar over time will go down because I think we're following policies that... Uh, uh, in connection with trade that will cause the dollar, I don't know whether it'll be in, uh, you know, six months, six years, ten years, but but the policies we're following as a country will cause the dollar, to, in, in my view, to decline. Primarily again. our trade deficit. Our trade deficit, right. And the, the flip side of our trade deficit is when we when we consume more than we produce, we have to trade the rest of the world something for that, and we give them our our assets. We give them IOUs of the government. We give them dollars initially, and then they can convert those into other, other assets in this country. So we are trading away assets in order to overconsume. As you said to me earlier, we're giving away pieces of the farm. Yeah, we give away pieces of the farm. We want to, we want to, we want to consume more than we produce, and so we trade away a little bit of the farm. And we, we've got such a big farm. I mean, yeah. it's you know, this is one prosperous country, yeah. but we, so we, we can trade away. We don't see it day by day, but it adds up. And it has consequences. More severe to you than the fiscal deficit. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, fiscal, our national debt in relation to GDP is, is not extraordinary. I mean, we've had plenty of times in the past when it's been higher, particularly after World War II. And I don't like it when it keeps going up as a percentage of GDP. But a very rich country can stand more debt than a, than a poorer country. And, and, and we, can ta we can handle a lot more debt than in the past. It, now, as that debt gets to be more and more owned by the rest of the world because of the of the trade deficit, you know, it 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 can cause problems down the line. Uh, but if you if you ask me whether I'd rather cure one or the other, uh, I would I would rather largely cure the trade deficit. Do you accept the argument that countries like China are locked into this dance with us yeah. because they need our market, so they're unlikely to dump American securities? Oh yeah. They, they, and instead, if they want to sell American securities, if they sell them to somebody in the United States, they get dollars with them. So they have to buy some, something else with the dollars. If they sell them to the French, the French now have them, you know, and, and, and the, the Chinese have got a claim on, on France. But they can't get, really get rid of them. They can, they can change their asset preference about the American assets they own. But China can't get rid of American assets, basically, or the rest of the world can't, unless we start 
uh, exporting as much to them as, as, as we're importing. And that day is not going to, it's coming. But it's there are coming. people who will suggest that there may be some catastrophic day. And we had that little tremor from the South Koreans about a year ago. There could be a catastrophic day. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, uh, but any time you have huge imbalances in the world and you have lots of people on hair triggers trading currencies and stock and bonds, you have the potential for catastrophic days. Back to the fiscal deficit and your sense of where we are. A lot of people look at the budget that they see today and they look 10 years out and they say with a baby boom generation coming in and Social Security and Medicare, you know, that we are looking at a, a huge problem downstream that either we got to raise taxes, cut spending, or change the age of the beneficiary. Yeah, we have to change the promises. I right. mean, what, a, a lot of what you see coming down the, uh, the road as really large looming problems revolve around promises. And, and uh, we won't, in my view, ever change the promise on Social Security. We may change it when you get into Medicare or something of that sort. No politician but, will suggest that. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> uh, but this country has incredible resources. It has more resources per capita than it had five or 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, we're not going backwards economically as a nation, but we have made a lot of promises. And we could, we could have a very rich family, Charlie, and, and our income could keep going up. But if I promised, you know, the elder members of the family that they would, you know, all live like multimillionaires, we could get in trouble. <clears throat> Tomorrow, a $60 billion friendship. How did it happen, and what does it mean for the world?